Hi, it's Robin. This is my TI-99-4A computer, which I don't think I've ever shown in a video before. This computer was originally released in June of 1981, so depending on when you watch this, it's been exactly 40 years since this computer was released. When we think of the popular North American home computers of the late 1970s and early 1980s, there's always the big three of Apple, Commodore, and Tandy, Radio Shack. And then a lot of people think of Atari as well, and they were certainly a contender for a while. But the other major player that I think often gets forgotten is Texas Instruments. Apparently they sold 2.8 million of these computers before they called it quits in 1984. Even though they sold so many computers, they were losing tremendous amounts of money doing that. Commodore was driving the prices of computers down. TI tried to compete with Commodore on price, and they lost that battle. But they had no one to blame but themselves, because TI had done exactly the same thing to Commodore with calculator prices. And Jack Tremell of Commodore learned his lessons there and vowed that would never happen again. Commodore bought their own chip manufacturers, so they could have the same vertical integration advantage that TI had and beat them at their own game in the next round, which were home computers. Now, this actually wasn't TI's first entry into the home computer market. Before the TI-99-4A in 1981, they had released the TI-99-4, which in most ways is a very similar machine, very similar case, the most noticeable difference is that the 4 had a cheaper chiclet-type keyboard, and it also had a similar but somewhat inferior graphics chip, lacking a bitmap mode. So the TI-99-4A introduced a better keyboard, and also a much lower introductory price, which dealt with much of the criticism of the original TI-99-4. The cartridges, which are also called command modules. Noel's Retro Lab called it like a, a runway or a landing. <laughs> Is this like a, a landing strip or a runway? I don't know. And they get plugged in there. And apparently they can actually be hot swapped, though I never do that. At the front is the power switch and the power LED. The original 4 is almost identical, but it does have this headphone jack here, or at least some models do. Apparently some even have a volume dial on here, but mine doesn't. I've heard that some don't even have this headphone jack, so apparently there were various revisions to the 99.4. Here on the left side is one 9-pin D-sub, and that's a joystick connector. You might think that like the VIC-20, that means it can only have one joystick. Well, it's got one joystick port. <laughs> But it comes with two joysticks connected into one port. While these joysticks look okay, they're among some of the worst I've ever had to play with. Single fire button and the stick. The whole thing, even when it was new, the whole thing kind of felt like it was creaking and groaning when you <laughs> move it. I'm sure I'll complain about that more later when I try playing a game or two. On the back are very few connectors compared to most other home computers. It has a 5-pin DIN here, and that's the audio-visual output. Unfortunately, if you have a 5-pin cable for your Commodore 64, that's the same pinout both for composite video and for audio. Now, this is only true for NTSC machines. Apparently, PAL machines have a 6-pin DIN with component video. Anyway, I don't have one of those. And there's the power connector. Curiously, this takes two different AC voltages. Very unusual, and then the DC conversion is done internally. And just to look at that power supply, you can see mine is safety checked. This one, at revision A, presumably made the 10th week of 1983. And the output is pins 1 and 2, 18 volts AC. Pins 2 and 4, 7.5 volts AC. And like most bricks, it's got both in and out on the same side. So 
There's the computer end with pins 1, 2, 3, and 4 all labeled. And on the 120 volt side, it's kind of weird. This looks like you think that's an extension cord, but I actually tried pulling that apart and it doesn't want to come apart. I'm afraid I might break it. And it's like this is like factory installed. It's got this extension that's probably, it's maybe about three feet long. It has this funny thing on it. Texas Instruments, Inc. ATA 0383, power supply part number 9500-2, caution 125 volts, 0.5 amp maximum for use with Texas Instruments, computer model TI-994A only. So I guess that's not supposed to be removed. Actually, I did a bit of googling and I really couldn't find much about this. So if anybody knows what the story is here, I am curious. And there's another 9-pin connector, which you might hope is for another joystick, but no, that is the tape input-output. That needs a special dongle to connect to a tape deck, which I don't have. And over on this side is an expansion door. It's got an edge connector in there. I believe that's where a disk drive and some other expansions can attach. This is probably the first 16-bit home computer, but if that's said without qualification, it's very misleading. This computer is slower than most 8-bit contemporaries. At least the performance of the BASIC that's built in runs about half the speed of other 8-bit computers. The 16-bit processor is on a 16-bit bus, and all it can access is 8 kilobytes of ROM and 256 bytes of RAM. And all the rest of the system, the main 16K of RAM that gets used both as video RAM and extra storage, and the video controller, and everything else, is all on an 8-bit bus. So it is 16-bit, but it's a very underwhelming 16-bit. Okay, I'm going to hook this up and let's try a couple games. I'll try powering it up now. Okay, so when it boots up, it comes up with this menu where we can just choose TI Basic. But I'm going to save that for another episode. So actually, for the first time ever, I'm going to try this hot swapping. So I got the game here, Parsec. And here we go. Okay, well, hot swap. <laughs> it reboots. Oh, well, there we go. I can choose Parsec. Press any key to begin, 1982. I think this is the best game for the TI-99. At least the best, like, action game. It's a good shooter. Maybe close to a killer app for the platform. Okay, we'll give it a go with this very underwhelming joystick. Alien Craft Advancing. So this game does have auto fire, and your laser overheats if you use it too much. I don't know if you can hear the joystick just creaking away in my hand. ships take two hits and you gotta just keep moving or you are doomed. There we go. Alien craft advancing. Collision with enemy craft. So what's amusing about this game is that <laughs> when you, whatever way you die, it reports it down at the bottom of the screen there. Oh, hit by photon missile. Oh, yeah. 
Those guys come from behind her. Yes, there's a pattern to it. Oh. Crash with ground. Oh. Caution asteroid belt. Those are pretty cool. They're like almost A. Hey, we got old oh, laser over here. So that's what's tough about that auto fire. Look out, obstacles ahead. Thank you. That was a pretty good game. So some quirks for this it says press redo or back and redo or back are kind of like function key. You have to hold this function button, which is like another shift and either redo or back. If you wait too long, it goes back to this tile screen. TI games often don't let you just use the, the joystick fire button to advance the game, you have to use the keyboard at various points. I don't know why they decide that. Another quirk here is it says press fire to begin, but you can move your ship. And you see how the game has not begun. Right? So you can freely move. And even more interestingly, the game hasn't begun. Well, look, you can die. Crash with ground and you lose one of your li lives, and then the game starts. So, this is one of the very rare, <laughs> very few games in existence where you can die when you're not actually playing the game. Like when your game hasn't started. <laughs> so it gives you an idea of how tough the game is. So try that again. Press redo, and you have to press them really close together to avoid going back to that tile screen. Press fire to begin, or just move around and die. And one other interesting thing is where it says lift down below, it's actually at the speed that your ship moves. And three is the fastest. You can press one and then your ship moves extremely slowly and two is kind of a middle speed it's still kind of uselessly slow for most of the time and then now here's lift three where it's almost a little too fast because it's easy even with auto fire to just miss some ships Okay, function, quit. Oh, and the other game I want to try is Car Wars. I'll plug the command module in. So I actually have Car Wars boxed here. For years I've been trying to get the other cover art for this Car Wars game that instead of these, you know, fake computer pixel graphics, I think it's the European edition. And I really want that one for my collection. I haven't been able to get a copy. So if you want to sell me one, please contact me. Okay, for Car Wars. Notice that Car Wars can't figure out if there's a space between the two words or not. Depends where you're looking. So we'll choose that. So it's two words here. Now this game is intriguing to me, not because of the gameplay so much. It's an okay game. It's actually a clone of an arcade game from 1979 called Head On. There was also an Atari 2600 clone called Dodgem. But the TI Car Wars game has really nothing to do with this Car Wars by Steve Jackson Games. This is a board game 
a tabletop game that involves dice and statistics, battle cars in the future, kind of like Mad Max. I think I've mentioned before how much I love Car Wars. Now here you can see that this game called Auto Duel, a futuristic fast-paced strategy role-playing game by Lord British and Chuckles based on the Car Wars board game by Steve Jackson. Same art. Why is the board game called Car Wars and why is the computer game called Auto Duel? Well, because of this. TI ended up with the trademark on Car Wars for computer games. And yeah, just give this a quick try. Another one where you have to press any key to begin, and you have to use the keyboard. We'll choose the easiest difficulty. Okay, and uh, the computer is the yellow car. I'm the what? I don't know, more detailed one. Whoops. And basically the computer car is suicidal, unfortunately. And he's just doing everything he can to ram into you. So you just have to kind of keep looking ahead and figure out what lane he's going to change into and try to get ahead. It's actually a really tough game. <laughs> you can speed up, you can do a boost with by hitting the fire button. And again, we have this prompt about pressing redo or back. I'll go back. All right, so that's a first look at the TI-99 4A. I plan on doing another video very soon about programming this in BASIC, thanks to a viewer donation I was given. So we'll look at that soon. Thanks to my patrons for their support. If you haven't subscribed already, I would really appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.